Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to uh, today's webinar, Tapping into Pollution Prevention, Wastewater Challenges at Craft Breweries and Distilleries. Uh, I'd like to begin by giving a uh, shout out to Dan Roberts with the Alabama Brewers Guild for uh, helping to uh, bring all this together. Uh, Dan and I had originally uh, planned to have this as a face-to-face -face meeting, but uh, uh, as we all know, the pandemic kind of changed everything we were planning to do this year. And so uh, thanks to everyone that kind of helped to bring it uh, as a as a virtual meeting and uh, and a uh, virtual webinar. And UA Safe State is happy to be the host of today's program. My name is Michael Raspberry. I'm the associate director of UA Safe State. Uh, also on the line uh, is Ashley Chambers. She's going to be monitoring the chat feature, which is how we will accept uh, questions. Uh, uh, for our speaker today and uh, Ashley will also you know, kind of make some closing statements and and so forth later on uh, a little bit about UA safe state for those of you who uh, may not uh, know of us uh, we're part of the College of Continuing Studies at the University of Alabama and uh, we consist of uh, a, a few different programs we are the state uh, occupational health and safety consultation program uh, who offer uh, free consultation uh, visits to small businesses in the state of Alabama. Uh, we also have an environmental program that uh, uh, we work with businesses offering technical assistance for environmental compliance. Uh, we have some field services components where we do things like indoor air quality assessments and mold assessments. And then we're also the state uh, of Alabama pollution prevention program. Uh, UA Safe State uh, also offers a number of, of training and conferences that are in the uh, realm of uh, occupational health and safety and environmental issues. So uh, I guess to begin uh, with today, uh, Scott Thurston is on the line to introduce ABS Commercial. Uh, ABS in conjunction with the Alabama Brewers Guild kind of helped us to uh, facilitate this webinar. So Scott, would you please uh, share a few words uh, with regards to ABS? Sure. First, I'd like to thank uh, everybody for being here. Um, unfortunately, we did, like, like I said, didn't get to join, didn't get to visit. Um, but just wanted to give you a little background about ABS Commercial. Um, we have been in business since 2012. Um, we actually use the same equipment that we sell every day at our 20 barrel brewery here in Raleigh, North Carolina, Raleigh Brewing Company. So we always invite you to stop by, have a beer. We've got a nice homebrew shop there. If you need any supplies like that, um, we'd be happy to show you the, you know, show you our facility. It's a 20 barrel system, and we've also got a three barrel um, pilot system that we use for small batch systems. Um, some of the customers we have in, in Alabama include Back 40, Ghost Train, Black Warrior. Used to be Red Hills, now I think it's uh, the Grocery Brew Pub. But um, you know, those are some of the people that we have or some of our customers uh, that we have in that area. Um, we cover all the way uh, from, from the U.S. We do U.S., Canada. We've even done BrewDog in uh, um, Scotland and uh, have some bigger customers. So we can build anything from three barrels up to 240s and brew houses from three all the way up to, uh, we've done a 60 barrel up in Nashville. So uh, we're here to help you guys. Um, said we actually use equipment and live this every day. So we love seeing breweries growing and I love having Southeast as my territory, including Alabama. So I'm here to help. My email address uh, shows up right there. Also wanted to point out my screen on the back, I don't know if you can see it, but we're giving away um, a uh, keg washer. It's a $10,000 keg washer. We're giving away one here on December 12th. We did this um, in, in the spring, we gave it away in June, and we're gonna be doing it again on December 12th. So be sure to hop online there and check out the keg biking section on that page and you can enter the contest. All right, Thanks having me here. Thank, thanks, Scott. Uh, so, for those of you listening live, uh, I'd like to uh, wish all of you a very happy uh, Pollution Prevention Week. Uh, our team would also like to thank the uh, EPA uh, Pollution Prevention Grant Program that helps to fund UA Safe State's P2 program mission and working with Alabama businesses to 
reduce waste and save money. Uh, the, the funding helps us uh, give the opportunity to provide important training uh, like this webinar that we're doing today. Uh, we also are, uh, are able to provide technical assistance uh, for uh, pollution prevention at uh, businesses in, in Alabama. So uh, before I hand it over to, uh, to our speaker, there are a few housekeeping items to cover about the presentation and the platform that we're using. To reduce background noise, all attendees have been muted. Uh, if you have a question for our speaker, please send it through the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen and uh, we'll be answering those questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, Ashley is going to be uh, keeping a tally on those, so don't be uh, bashful. If you have a question for, uh, for our speaker, just uh, go and access that chat feature. Uh, if we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we'll be sure to follow up with you afterwards. And just uh, an FYI, there's not a hard stop at uh, 11 o'clock for this thing. And so we do have a flexible time built in. I realize that if you have a tight schedule and need to, to drop out, uh, that's fine. But we do plan on uh, recording this uh, webinar and we're going to make it available soon. So uh, for those of you that uh, kind of missed the end of it, if you need to go to another meeting, uh, we will have the, uh, the uh, end of the webinar available as a recording. I am uh, pleased to introduce today's speaker, uh, Mr. Jim Graciano. Jim manages the uh, compliance assistance and ombudsman programs at the Alabama Department of Environmental Management. He works with small businesses in Alabama, helping them to navigate water and wastewater concerns. He also supports the University of Alabama Industrial Pollution Prevention Program and works with Alabama water and wastewater utilities to troubleshoot operational issues. So Jim comes at this from a, from a lot of experience uh, and a, a frustrated home brewer. Jim has been with ADEM for uh, 23 years and has 35 years of experience in water and, and wastewater treatment. So uh, Jim, with that, uh, if you'll please share your screen with the group, we'll go ahead and kick it over to you. Okay, let's see. Uh, can you all see my screen right now? I do not. Not yet, Jim. Okie dokie. Let me figure out how to do this. We had this issue yesterday and I knew I know I didn't do it so well, but I'm going to figure it out. All righty. Somewhere there's a, here we go, share screen. Now you should have my screen, I believe. Do you see it now? Not me. Sure, I don't see it. Darn, darn it. All right, hold on a minute. What did I do wrong here? Uh, Now I got it. Now you should see it. Yes, we're all good. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad to be here today to go over wastewater issues and uh, some general pollution prevention issues that we may not typically think about. I mean, you all are pretty focused on, on uh, creating some great beer but you, you're going to find out if you don't know already that dealing with waste uh, and waste treatment, wastewater discharge is something that is really integral to your business, whether or not you are aware of it right now. I imagine most of you are, but I hope you learn from what I'm going to present today. And um, it, I'm just happy to make a connection to the Alabama Brewers Guild with um, UA Safe state. Okay. We've got a lot to cover here. Um, just pardon the motherhood a little bit, but um, I know y'all are a, a big growing sector and um, everybody loves their, their craft beer. Uh, seems like every year we've got more and more craft breweries coming into uh, existence in the state and we're really glad to, to see that. 
Um, and I do know that most of y'all are innovative in what you do from a business standpoint. And uh, most of y'all are, are really good environmental stewards. And um, it's just a great business to be in. But I'm also aware that uh, to be a savvy brewer, you've got to account for everything. Um, uh, avoiding potential liability to every business owner is important and minimizing your operational costs is, is critical to your survival. And we're obviously dealing with COVID-19 crisis matters that we, we never anticipated, but being aware of pollution prevention, uh, your employees, general environmental matters, things like that are going to help your business succeed and uh, do good things for your, your brand. So beer is 90 to 95 percent water. That's nothing new to y'all. And obviously good quality water is really critical. And beer brewing is a water intensive commercial um, business. Um, and as well, y'all are a fairly big generator of wastewater. And that's what we're going to focus on today. We will talk a little bit about water use, but we're going to focus mainly on waste. So our goal is to partner with you and help your brewery business flourish. But today we're here to talk to you uh, and hopefully establish some thought processes that are going to make you focus on water usage and energy usage uh, in the in the future uh, to make you as efficient as possible. And we want to help you avoid environmental concerns that may not be on your radar screen right now. Things that are going to contribute to environmental liability have the potential to adversely affect your business maybe result in you having unanticipated legal costs and, and hopefully find a way to prevent uh, or minimize the potential for excessive monthly operating costs. Uh, so we're going to discuss some beer brewing waste and wastewater characteristics. We're going to focus on ways to reduce waste. Uh, Lowering your BOD loading discharge, and we're going to talk about that term BOD in a lot of detail. It, it's a, the term is defined by biochemical oxygen demand, and before this next hour is over, you're going to know a lot about that and understand it pretty well. Um, and, and be aware of potential sewer use fees that y'all are paying right now, many of you are, and, and some of you are not, but could very well become a reality uh, in the near future. So we got a lot to discuss, and I got to blow through this in, in uh, as best I can in 45 minutes. I think you can ask questions through the chat box along the way, and um, Michael and Ashley will uh, maybe interrupt and, and ask some questions along the way, but we'll also be here um, afterwards when this presentation is done to talk about more details. But I think it's, uh, it's interesting just to point out that y'all are operators of a brewery, and um, when you discharge your wastewater, it goes to the operator of a wastewater plant. And we're going to talk about how your utility treats your wastewater because you really need to have a very good appreciation of that technology that is, is happening behind the scenes. Uh, Y'all have seen these kind of Venn diagram things before, but I mean, every, every brewery out there has got to be thinking of what has been called the triple bottom line, environmental protection, social responsibility, um, economic success, and it all joins in the whole idea of sustainable principles. Um, the, the new lingo 
that EPA tends to use is people, profit, and planet. It's really the same thing when you think about it. No matter how you look at it, it all comes down to sustainability, doing the right thing environmentally while while you're uh, having a really successful business that produces the profit and the jobs and everything you all need and everything we need to get great beer. But in general, beer brewing waste uh, generates some pretty high levels of, of uh, waste. And you all know this, you deal with it day to day. You've got spent grain, um, which is a good beneficial byproduct. And um, you know, while I'm at it, Michael or Ashley, can you all hear me just to confirm? Yeah, we hear you loud and clear, Jim. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. Um, uh, you all deal with Troub or, or Trub, I think, depending on what country you're in, uh, the sediment remaining at the bottom of the fermentation vessel, uh, spent waste from, um, from yeast, Kieselgur, which is the diatomaceous earth filter aid you all might be using. Obviously, the goal is to produce, produce alcohol, but we're going to talk about why that's important from a wastewater standpoint. And you might have some high gravity wort or, um, and of course, some uh, clean in place uh, wash up wastewater that's produced daily by your business. But managing your waste is really critical to save you money. Uh, and also to avoid a lot of potential trouble. And we're going to talk about that briefly so you understand what liabilities exist out there for y'all. When you don't manage your waste right, it's going to, on the other side, it's going to cost you money and it really could be devastating to your business. So a couple of examples. This is, um, Revolution Brewing in Chicago, uh, fairly recently. That I was trying to put a video on here, but every time I do that, something goes wrong. But you can see in the top left picture, you had a, a waste hauling company backing in to, uh, to move their truck and just spilled a whole bunch of troop in a residential area, caused an odor problem, got people pretty upset. Obviously, the uh, brewery didn't expect that. But what's the worst that can happen? How bad can things get? Well, here's cores. Um, this is going back quite a few years ago, but just I was looking for some examples to show you. And they uh, spilled 77,000 gallons of beer and wastewater into a local stream, local river, and it killed about 50,000 fish through several miles. And you could just imagine what kind of trouble that was for this really big company. Um, civil penalties, remediation costs, and golly, geez, just the attorney fees alone were uh, not something we would want to envision from a business standpoint here. But even from a craft brewery standpoint, they still got their issues too to worry about. And here's something, uh, Topper Brewery, uh, discharges its wastewater to a local wastewater treatment plant, city plant, and it caused an upset in the city treatment plant, which caused the uh, city wastewater treatment plant to discharge 1.8 million gallons of uh, poorly treated wastewater to Lake Champlain. So this is a, a happens to be a, a, a publicly owned wastewater plant that had some ongoing problems but when this particular brewery discharged something out of the ordinary there, it, it really caused an impact to the city wastewater plant. Uh, Oscar Blues in Nashville, uh, Asheville, North Carolina, kind of a similar thing where their brewing operation was impacting the sewage treatment plant. And, um, in this case, the right decision for them was to build their own treatment plant, a 1.5 million gallon treatment plant, because the city utility could not handle their 
raw wastewater load, so they had to treat their own wastewater. And we're not really talking distilleries, but just so you know that distilleries have other concerns. We're making really high concentrations of alcohol, and uh, that can cause all, all sorts of different um, environmental scenarios. And this is a uh, uh, um, distillery that had a release to a creek. And what we're looking at there is a fire on a waterway. And this is a bourbon plant. So they actually have something called affectionately a bourbonado. Uh, it's really something to, to see, but it's also a pretty tragic, shocking event. Uh, so our breweries here in Alabama have, have other concerns from a, a critical liability standpoint that we want y'all to be aware of. Y'all store chemicals that can be reactive. You probably have caustics and various acids that you're using for uh, cleanup. Well, you don't want to mix these, these two types of chemicals because that's going to cause a violent reaction if you mix a, a caustic and an acid in a uh, large volume situation. You need to store these chemicals separately and make sure that there's no chance of uh, accidentally having a, a PLC divert one chemical to, uh, to another tank, let's say, or, or put two chemicals in a tank at the same time as well as uh, sanitizing chemicals. These cleaners are, are oxidizers. And uh, if we're looking at a pure ox, that's 34% peroxide. That's a super strong disinfectant. And uh, it has the ability to be very reactive with, with organic chemicals. So it's important to note, out, note that um, any kind of uncontrolled release, of course, a, a spill can affect the environment, it can affect your employees, it can cause a hazardous atmosphere, fire, lots of, lots of issues that you all got to be concerned about. So think about these what-if scenarios, because your brand is, is everything. And uh, well, I sure hope we don't have somebody that would have such low ingenuity to have a brewery called ABC Brewery, but, um, but if we do, I've, I've put your name here, uh, because you don't want to have a, a, a name like this, uh, or an article come out in the paper that says, again, I just made this up, ABC Brewery causes fish kill, or if you get sued by your local utility, or a local river keeper files a lawsuit, these are the things you don't want to wake up to, folks, in your business. Now, that's kind of a little bit of a scare tactic, but uh, I wanted you to be aware, aware of that. There's really no needs, reason to fear overall because y'all run a good business and implementing some common sense and good planning is going to prevent these kind of disaster scenarios from occurring. So we're going to delve really into uh, wastewater issues for breweries in uh, in more detail here, but I, as I sort of um, mentioned briefly earlier, y'all are operators of a biological system. <clears throat> You're nurturing a, a culture of of yeast, and um, so is your utility. It's not yeast. It's a it's a different biological culture, but uh, they're relying on a biological culture and a whole different, wholly different biological reaction. But um, we're all in, in a similar world. Uh, wastewater treatment operators for your city and breweries have a lot of, of common connections. And uh, just FYI, if um, y'all want to moonlight as a wastewater operator, y'all would probably make very good wastewater operators because you're familiar with some of the things that we deal with on the wastewater side of things. So again, from a, from a comparative standpoint, 
y'all are depending on a yeast culture in an anaerobic fermentation reaction. You're going to convert um, organic material using yeast to do what they do. They produce alcohol when you feed them organic material. And on a wastewater treatment standpoint, or from a wastewater treatment standpoint, your utility is depending on and, and nurturing a culture of aerobic bacteria. So your city wastewater plant is growing more cells, not yeast, but they're growing cells to convert organic material, um, which is our human waste and, and beer waste to CO2. They're kind of doing what we do. We breathe in air and, and produce CO2 based on uh, uh, the burrito I ate today or yesterday, and, and we're producing CO2 with our biological cells. Well, your wastewater plant's doing something similar. So your product is alcohol that you ship off to happy customers, and at your wastewater utility, their product is clean water for discharge, and uh, they're going to give it to happy fish and, and citizens. In a brewery, your waste, besides wastewater generation through cleanup and what have you, um, your waste is the yeast that you grew to produce the alcohol, which you recycle or ship off for disposal. And at the wastewater plant, uh, their waste is the cells that they grew, uh, which they also ship off for disposal or, or dispose in a landfill. They, they have a lot of options of what they do with it, with their uh, cell growth that they produce every day. But uh, the waste cells from a city wastewater utility get further treated. A lot goes into that. Um, and, and that's a really labor intensive, costly issue for a utility. So having an appreciation of that will maybe open your eyes to some important things. Uh, from an energy standpoint, in a brewing business, you need to, to provide heat, heat to uh, satisfy your yeast culture and get them to flourish. And in a wastewater plant, your utility needs to provide oxygen for the bacterial culture to flourish. Because again, they're, they're aerobic creatures just like us. So what do we do with it from the wastewater side? We aerate the crap out of it. And um, there's different ways that we, we do it. Uh, this is just an example of the many ways that aeration is provided. We've got surface aerators in a lagoon. We've got a kind of a, a, a catfish type aerator here in a, in a basin. And then we've got diffused air here. These are all Alabama plants, by the way. But uh, producing or generating oxygen in a wastewater utility is probably the most costly thing. About two-thirds of the cost to operate a wastewater utility goes to producing the oxygen that the organic material needs. And what you're looking at here, this is um, a culture of bacteria that are, are treating the waste that gets discharged to this basin, whether it be food product waste or, or other human waste from sanitary wastewater. So what happens, again, we're all biological treatment system operators in some way. What happens if your yeast becomes impaired or dies, well, that's bad news because you've got no beer. And what happens to the wastewater plant if their bacterial culture becomes impaired or dies? Well, it's really bad news for them because they're going to discharge polluted water. It's going to impair their treatment system. Now we get down to the regulatory aspects of, of what is, is done. Um, how is your discharge regulated? In, in some way, whether directly, if you happen to have had or have your own treatment system, 
which I don't think we have a craft brewery that has a biological wastewater plant. If you're a Coors um, or a, a Miller, you, you bet you got your own wastewater treatment plant, but most of us depend on, uh, on the craft brewery side of things, uh, local utility to treat that wastewater that we produce. But somebody at the utility then has its own permit that my agency will have issued or whatever state you're in. Uh, it's called the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System or affectionately an NPDES permit where this utility has got to comply with the Clean Water Act. So they're taking wastewater from various industries and commercial entities and citizens around the, the city and they've got to comply with the limits to be able to discharge the treated wastewater, treated sewage into a local waterway. Uh, so again, these large breweries are going to have their own plant, but all of our craft breweries, breweries here in Alabama discharge to a publicly owned treatment works or POTW which is just another term for a municipal wastewater treatment plant. Now, if you are a significant, significant industrial discharge, if you produce 25,000 gallons per day, or if your organic load, the amount of uh, material you discharge that's biodegradable, if that comprises 5% of the capacity of your city treatment plant, then the state agency, the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, will issue you a state indirect discharge permit. So if you discharge to a small utility, uh, and your, your brewery is located in a small town, you very well may comprise greater than 5% of the organic load of that treatment plant. You discharge to, let's say, a large 30 million gallon treatment system uh, city utility here in, in Montgomery or up in Huntsville, uh, you're not going to comprise 5% of the plant's organic load and you, you will not end up with a state indirect discharge permit. Now, even though, as I said earlier, brewing waste is a water intensive uh, commercial enterprise, most of our craft breweries will not be a significant user from an organic loading standpoint. So what does that mean? That means in nearly every case, a craft brewery discharge will be regulated by a local municipal sewer ordinance. So it's, a, it's an agreement between you and your city utility, and the state will not get involved. Now, just because you've got a, a, an agreement doesn't mean you don't need to, to think about spills and releases. Um, either that could bypass the sewer system and go into a local creek, or uh, get discharged right to the sewer. There, there's some concerning implications for when that happens, but obviously if you have a discharge, let's say a release of 2,000 or 20,000 gallons to a local creek, let's say if you have a tank bust or a sump pump go bad, uh, you by definition have an unpermitted discharge to a local stream. You don't hold a permit to do that, so the, the state would probably step in and uh, take enforcement on you. So again, in most cases, your business is going to have to comply with a city ordinance. And that city ordinance is designed to protect the utility's assets. They've got a, a costly treatment system uh, infrastructure that they have to protect. And as well, they're incurring a cost to treat your wastewater. So they are probably, or at least in many cases, going to um, 
ask you to, to pay for that cost with time of treating your wastewater. And depending on the tax structure, your utility may not surcharge you, may not charge you a monthly fee. And it really, really depends on, uh, I don't know this to be exactly true, but let's say Toyota comes into Huntsville and Toyota essentially pays for the treatment system and um, the city of Huntsville is, is able to treat its waste uh, through its tax structure and the number of citizens and the number of the amount of taxes that some big industries are paying, they may not issue a surcharge to some small businesses like, like uh, local breweries. But truthfully, most savvy utilities are going to go out there and look for, okay, whose waste are we treating? Where is our, our costs coming from? And they're going to reach out to y'all and have you share in that cost of what it costs for them to treat your wastewater. So in Alabama, and this is a total swag on my part, I, I did not do a, a uh, detailed inventory of this, but just overall my sense of the matter is that about half of the uh, craft breweries discharge to a local city utility that imposes a usually monthly sewer surcharge. So no matter what, you're probably going to pay a, a one-time connection fee to, you, to your utility. And as well, many of you are going to pay a monthly fee for the treatment of your waste, uh, waste water that you generate. So a lot of y'all are probably thinking, well, heck, I don't have a surcharge. I'm good to go. And maybe you're starting to fall asleep. But um, don't, don't get too comfortable because just because you don't pay a surcharge now does not mean that your utility won't adopt a new sewer ordinance that, that pulls you in. Uh, or they may reassess their operational load and say, hey, you know, this ABC brewery is kind of impacting us. We, we need to go recover some costs from them. And your utility, for instance, may be planning for a wastewater treatment plant upgrade. So they're about to uh, uh, take out a big loan, maybe a five or $20 million loan to build a treatment plant. And citizens are paying that for uh, through monthly sewer fees, but then they start to evaluate the commercial loading and think, you know, we need commercial entity A, B, and C to, um, to kick in for some of this cost because uh, they're getting the benefit of the treatment that we provide to that brewery. So now we're going to start to get into a uh, little more detail. Uh, I had mentioned early on that we've got this BOD term. If you all have a sewer ordinance that you're complying with, you're intimately familiar with this term, but it's biochemical oxygen demand. It's a measure of how much oxygen a biological culture will uh, use, will take out of the water to, or to degrade or biologically process that waste. And in Usually you've got the term five because it's how much oxygen gets depleted in five days. You also may have a surcharge based on chemical oxygen demand. Now these two terms are very related and you need to be aware of that. But the chemical oxygen demand is, is a theoretical number um, based on how much oxygen would be degraded if every bit of material was oxidized. Essentially, it's a, it's a surrogate for the BOD test, and it's a measure of all the organic and inorganic material that can potentially be oxidized 
even if the bacteria can't metabolize that organic material. And I'm going to clarify that a little bit, but uh, the reason we use the COD term uh, versus BOD, and sometimes we'll use both because the two numbers tell you different things, but COD is always going to be greater than BOD. And why do we use a COD test? Because it's a really quick test. We oxidize the heck out of a, a sample in two hours at extreme temperatures under acidic conditions just to see how much material can be oxidized. Whereas a BOD5 test involves setting up a series of uh, beakers and bottles and incubating the sample at 20 degrees C over five days. It's just a pain in the butt to do the test. But to show you what this, these terms mean, and this is really important, folks, so kind of pay attention to understand what's, what's happening here. But this is um, how much oxygen in a, a, a chemical reaction, just put on your good old high school chemistry um, hat here, or college chemistry, but how much oxygen do you need to oxidize an amount of ethanol? This happens to be one mole of ethanol, but it ends up being 2.09 milligrams of oxygen per milligram of ethanol, which is kind of a lot of what we're producing here, a surrogate for, for beer for, for right now. Now, now, what does this mean? Well, you're not going to uh, be able to oxidize all that material. So if you were to feed that to a, a culture, they'll only use about 1.7 milligrams of oxygen. So that COD-BOD ratio is very low, folks. It's 1.2. Now, what? Uh, let me give you a comparative thing. Depending on what kind of chemical you're dealing with, and um, every theoretical or chemical oxygen demand value is going to be different. Now, what we deal with from a waste standpoint is, crap, you take anything out of a sewer, you got hundreds, maybe thousands of chemicals in there, and, and uh, we don't look at it that way to look at each component, but we just generate an overall COD value for a waste just like we would do with, with beer. So typical sewage, it's important to know that the COD to BOD ratio is about 1.5 to 2. And for industrial wastewaters, that value might be 6. Now, for ethanol or for, let's say, for beer, it's going to be only 1.2. Now, what does that mean? That means Brewery wastewater is extremely biodegradable. Shouldn't be surprising, but it's important. In comparison to typical sewage, brewery, brewery wastewater is way stronger um, and way more readily biodegradable. So if your brewery accidentally discharges waste beer to a stream, that creek is going to be damaged really quickly, folks. Just thinking about these um, spill events, so you, you think about what's happening, it's not usually a toxicity event when you discharge a, a um, brewery wastewater to a stream, but it's the result of a lack of oxygen in the stream. And uh, I'm going to tie this together as far as a wastewater treatment standpoint goes in, in just a couple of slides, but... This is what happens. This is your brewery waste discharge to a stream, and we're looking at a downstream direction here. Let's say this is a, a half mile. Um, the or, uh, organic culture, bacterial culture in that stream, which is there, is now going to see this waste and start to grow and respire and take up oxygen. And what, what's going to happen is there's not going to be any fish in here. You're going to have fish floating on top of the water, kind of like what happened with um, Tyson Foods um, in the early summer or late spring uh, up, in, up in Hansville. I mean, these things happen. And uh, uh, 
what will happen is only the most hardy creatures are going to be able to survive, depending on the concentration of waste that you happen to have in your spill event. Um, <clears throat> so if your brewery release, let's say, and your anomaly, anomaly discharges right to the wastewater plant and doesn't result in a spill to a to your um, ditch behind your, your brewery, uh, the creek somewhere in town might be impacted because now your city wastewater plant is going to struggle to treat that spill event that you just had. So to show you a, a comparative example of, of just to get a feel for this in, in our business here, let's say you had 10,000 gallons of beer that you accidentally dumped. I mean, that'd be an economic disaster for you all too, but this stuff has happened. Well, that's 6% alcohol. Now, just dovetailing to what we talked about earlier and how much oxygen it takes to degrade that alcohol, well, that 10,000 gallons is almost 2 million grams of ethanol. Looking at the BOD, this results in 6,700 pounds of oxygen is what it would take to, to uh, satisfy the oxygen demand of the, the beer that you just dumped. Now you think about what it means to produce 6,700 pounds of oxygen. Well, just think about the amount of oxygen in your last breath. Maybe that was micrograms. Um, so we're talking about a lot of oxygen, folks. So if your brewery discharges waste beer to a city wastewater plant, that utility immediately has to provide oxygen to its bacterial culture with those aerators that I showed you a picture of to maintain the viability of its wastewater plant and keep its bacterial culture alive, degrading waste from the city. Now, um, <clears throat> if the city's not prepared to handle the load you just dumped, they now have a risk of violating their discharge limits for the permit that ADEM issued to your city to comply with the Clean Water Act. So again, this means that that utility has to provide 6,700 pounds of oxygen to its aeration basin to degrade the dumped beer. Now that's, that's a lot of oxygen, oxygen, and because it's so biodegradable, they got to do it immediately. The BOD that we produce from yesterday's burrito and what have you and the, the, the quinoa that your wife's making you eat every day is about... 0.17 pounds of BOD per person per day. So that means that the 10,000 gallon release of beer we just had is the equivalent sewage load of 40,000 people. So if your local utility maybe treats sewage from 100,000 people, which is a pretty good sized city here in Alabama, do you think they're going to notice a spill of 10,000 gallons, which is only 0.1% of the volume loading on the plant? Well, heck yeah. You, you know, you bet they're going to see it because that 100,000 person town is now seeing a, a waste load for 140,000 people. So your wastewater utility plant operator is in for a bad day. They they are going to be calling me up saying, Jim, we got a we got an, an anomaly here. We're having some trouble. So utility will have an upset and violate its permit for discharge to a stream. Now, that's only if it's not prepared to respond. In many cases, they your utility is is well suited to respond to an emergency, but not every not in every case, folks. So other things we need to know about, I'm going to try and expedite things and move this along, but 
you need to know about the term total suspended solids. Solids um, coming in through a wastewater plant, uh, your ordinance will have a limit of, of how much total suspended solids you can discharge. And that's the, the stuff that is going to be degraded in your plant or is a solid and removed at the front end of the plant before biological treatment. <clears throat> You've got a term called total Keldol nitrogen, really from, it just, it's just nitrogen, folks. How much nitrogen content is in your beer waste? And total phosphorus is just what it says. Uh, it's all about organic material and then a subset of that organic material is nitrogen and phosphorus. Also, your utility is going to be concerned with how much alkalinity you're discharging. Now, in general, we've got pretty good alkalinity in uh, brewer brewery wastewater, so uh, that's pretty good news. But alkalinity is really the ability of a solution to resist a pH change. Um, and pH is a unitless value. Value You all know that that's just a measure of how acidic or basic a wastewater is. So what does brewery wastewater look like? This is fairly typical, folks. Um, I'm going to present some Alabama values for you, but just from a literature search, this is typical. Um, BOD, about 3,200. Uh, COD about 5,300, um, CSS 1,800, anyway, uh, pretty high alkalinity value there. Low nitrogen, high phosphorus, that's interesting to, to point out, and that, that's important. So in comparison to an average sewage load, this is pretty typical, this is fairly strong sewage from a municipality, and this is the average brewery wastewater value uh, characteristics that you would discharge. And you can see it's, it's comparatively high. Um, so y'all are, are a notable impact to a wastewater plant. So you should have a good understanding of the important service that your wastewater utility is providing to your brewery. Um, and again, we're all operators of a biological system, and I think you can appreciate the challenges that they have to face every day, too, just like, like we do at the brewery to um, produce great beer. So it's important to develop a good relationship with your wastewater utility and your, um, your city government overall. Because they're, they're keeping you out of the wastewater business, folks. They're, they're doing that for you. So here's some Alabama breweries. And what's interesting here is how varied the uh, BOD levels are. Let's just look at, at BOD here. I mean, it's in that range for this brewery, 5,000. It's right along that value that we saw, and of course, some of them are higher, some of them are, are lower. Um, and I, we can talk a little bit more about why that is. Some notable numbers, I've got them highlighted in red, that the phosphorus level is high. Um, some of y'all have got significant solids, total suspended solids. Uh, not too much of a problem with oil and grease, but um, pretty, pretty varied amount. PH levels vary considerably. Um, so what could the surcharge mean to you and your business? Well, you may not pay a surcharge right now, so you're, you might be really happy about that. But be aware that uh, quite a number of us pay a, a reasonable surcharge fee, uh, pretty notable from maybe $10,000 per year or maybe over $100,000 per year. So it's, it's, a, it's a big part of our, our business from a, from a cost standpoint. It affects the bottom line. But 
you know, again, don't think that that comes for nothing. I mean, they are keeping you out of the wastewater business. Uh, it makes sense to lower your surcharge if you can to control in plant pollution sources. Why not lower that surcharge if possible? But again, just realize that they're allowing you to focus on what you do best, which is make great beer by keeping you out of the wastewater treatment business. Uh, you can bet that uh, Gores and Budweiser, they've got uh, huge city treatment plants that probably cover 50 acres of, of land <clears throat> and um, spend a lot of money treating their, their wastewater. So again, it, some of the take home messages here is that it, it our wastewater just from the, the Alabama values, they're, they're high in BOD, they're relatively deficient in nitrogen, which is interesting, and uh, they've got a high phosphorus content in our, our brewery wastewater. So that means if your city treatment plant discharges to a stream and has a phosphorus limit, they could potentially surcharge you for phosphorus loading. You may not have a phosphorus loading now, but you might in the future. Nominally, our pH is not a concern, um, but uh, again, because the alkalinity is reasonably high, and the pH is, is in the neutral realm, but this was not an extensive, exhaustive suite of, of data. And based on the chemicals that you use, you've got acids and bases that you're using in your cleaning process, and there are some concerns to be aware of because you, you might have swings in pH that uh, maybe happen at night during a cleanup operation. So you, you might be um, affecting not only your own equipment and materials, but are you, are you um, damaging a city lift station because you've got a really low pH that occurs at some point in the evening? Well, you want to make sure you, you do something about that because you're going to damage your own equipment, your own sewage lateral. Um, you're going to have corrosion to your own equipment, tanks and piping and stuff, so you, you definitely want to be careful of that. So looking at a public sewage treatment plant in more detail, um, we're, we're going to talk about that briefly, and i got to blow through this quick to get done, folks. But um, uh, every step in the process of what your city wastewater plant does gets produces cleaner and cleaner water until it's clean enough for discharge. So first, they're going to remove large solids and grit. That's that suspended solids, maybe, that you all are discharging. Then they're going to uh, delve into the, the biological process of what they do to remove the organic load that you're dumping on them, uh, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and that, that infamous BOD that we talked about. Then they're going to remove some fine particles and um, to do some polishing treatments. And then fourth, and finally, they're going to disinfect that wastewater because there's some pathogens in there they got to get rid of and, and kill before they discharge. So a lot goes into a city treatment plant. And what about the bacterial cells that they grow? Just like the waste yeast that we produce in a brewery, a large portion of a city wastewater plant is dedicated to biological sludge handling. And I'm going to present what that means pretty quickly. Uh, but you know, here's a process flow diagram. And, and take note that this aeration tank is where, where the sexy stuff happens, folks. Um, that's where your biological material is primarily degraded. So here's, here's a plant. This happens to be the Hoover Inverness plant. And here's a um, biological treatment system right here. We've got aerators that you can't see, but they're probably a couple hundred horsepower aerators on each side of that basin. Uh, C 
city sewage is coming in, it gets screened, goes through a biological treatment process, happens to have uh, anoxic anaerobic treatment, but that's not always the case. Uh, again, most of the organic load is, is uh, eliminated through aerobic treatment. Then it goes to a clarifier where we settle out that biological, that's kind of like the tube going to the bottom of a, of a uh, fermentation vessel. These are deep conical tanks in ground, but they're going to pump out that settled sludge and, um, and handle it. But uh, the treated water goes from here, the supernatant, goes to a final filter and then to a disinfection system, and then it gets pumped to a stream. So if I produce a color-coded look of what's happening with the residuals, all those cells, it's going to go from the bottom of these tanks to an aerobic digester, uh, and then sometimes they'll mechanically dewater it, but in this case, they produce it uh, or discharge it to these sludge drying beds. So some of them are covered, some are not. You could just imagine, we're talking a lot of acreage here, you could see a lot of this plant is covered up by sludge handling, the byproducts of a wastewater treatment process. So what our breweries do often to reduce the loading uh, on your city plant and essentially lower your surcharge is you probably heard this side streaming term. That's just a way of taking out your most concentrated loading, finding a way to deal with it in a, a, a solid handling standpoint and finding a way to recover that waste in a, in a solid form. And therefore, you don't pay a surcharge to discharge organic muck to your city sewage plant. And as, as well, it's important to just mention this term. It could be advantageous to have an equalization tank or a calamity tank, sometimes it's called, to collect spills to reduce your liability. Uh, and how, how far can we go with wastewater treatment? Well, we can go really far, folks. We can take municipal sewage and treat it to any degree that we want and actually produce makeup water for beer brewing. That's become a, a, a fairly uh, common pastime, uh, mostly out west because they've got water shortage and water, water limitations that we don't have here. Uh, we could do it here, but we've got a really rich uh, state resource of, of clean water. But we still do it. Um, every year we'll have brewing contests with uh, using recycled sewage water. So this has been a reality for quite some time uh, to treat sewage to a high degree. Um, and in some countries and, and out in the Southwest, they're gonna be forced to do that. Um, but we can do reverse osmosis. We can produce uh, portable water very readily. It's just a matter of, of cost. But you can see back in, um, uh, I think this is actually a 2015 article, folks. But anyway, uh, Oregon was uh, treating its recycled water to, to brew, brew its beer and got a permit to do it. Uh, to some degree, we're all using recycled water. If your utility water system, your drinking water system, draws water from a river, um, somewhere upstream of that river, there's a sewage discharge being uh, put into the river. So, um, you know, thank goodness they, they all treat it to the degree that they need to. And if your utility is happening to use, happens to use groundwater, well, then that groundwater age could be decades or centuries old. Uh, you could see north part of the state, about two thirds to, I'm sorry, one third to one half of the state is very much um, uh, surface water driven. And in the lower part of the state, we've got some deep, high quality aquifers where uh, our drinking water comes from. 
So just, just to finish up a couple of things, here's some COD of common items. Uh, sewage is about 400 milligrams per liter. Our beer is in, in this range, depending on what level of alcohol you're producing. If you're in the whiskey realm and you like your bourbon, well, look at that whopping COD level. Uh, obviously, cream, we've got ice cream manufacturers in the state and uh, takes an awful lot of utility work to, uh, to treat that wastewater. And some BOD of brewing components. Here's some good examples of you know, what's in your wort, what's, what's in your yeast. It's actually very biodegradable, of course. All the uh, sugar levels uh, in molasses uh, yield a, a high BOD. Again, I kind of changed terms, but BOD and COD, just a measure of organic material. Well, you can see some of the, the key numbers that we've got there. Well, there's a lot involved in brewing and sewage treatment, folks. I, I hope you got a good appreciation of that. I can't wait to go to my next um, uh, local brewery to get some beer. And um, I love to think about how it's, how it's made. Uh, so in conclusion, be aware of the waste generation processes in your brewery. Understand your current arrangement, your current ordinance, if you've got one, for the discharge of wastewater to your publicly owned treatment works or your city plant. And be aware that your discharge arrangement not only can, it will likely change in the future. So, so Keep your ear to the ground on this. Develop a good relationship with your wastewater utility. Um, know that you're purchasing a good deal of city water to produce your beer, but your water provider may, de may be a different utility or a different branch of your utility. Sometimes they're wholly different entities, and so you're paying a a water bill to one utility and when you get a surcharge bill you're paying it to another utility. When you have an anomaly, something unusual happens in your plant, whether you've got an ordinance or not that you're complying with, if something goes amiss, be in touch with your wastewater operator, your city utility, let them know what happened. To, uh, you'll save them a lot of trouble and avoid a lot of a lot of liability for you. If you have a regulatory ordinance, be aware that they're going to come out to sample. Um, so make sure you're, when they do come out to sample, it represents a typical discharge day. Don't do your worst monthly cleanup on the day that they come out to sample because otherwise your BOD load, or the organic content of your wastewater is going to be higher and it may not represent what your wastewater typically looks like. So you're going to end up paying a higher surcharge for a period of, who knows, maybe six months or a year based on, on that one day of sampling event that occurred. Track your water use, your energy use, and your wastewater surcharges that you get from your utility. Implement pollution prevention measures to lower your surcharge bills if you can. As well, implement water conservation measures to lower your city water bills. Your, your city water bill, I didn't present that number to you, but it's, it's, a, it's an important part of your business and, and you know that. If you can, um, provide a copy of the last year of, of your energy bills and water usage billing and wastewater surcharge bills to uh, University of Alabama Safe State. Uh, it will allow us to more closely assess your specific scenario, and if there's something we can do to help you, uh, we'd be glad to, to track that and take a closer look. If you don't already have one, consider developing a sampling plan to characterize your wastewater sources. If you don't know what it looks like, uh, Having that data will help you look at potential cost savings for sewer discharges, maybe not now, but maybe in the future. 
um, help you realize what you can do to lower your solid waste disposal. Are you all paying for disposal of solids that could be recyclable, uh, which are, are presently not being done? Uh, it could identify a way to optimize some raw materials, whether it be chemical usage or, or even um, some other or brewing constituents that you're realizing are being overdosed. And uh, of course, it can save you to optimize water use also. So as they say, uh, kind of like we say, no operator, no water on the uh, wastewater treatment side. It's also a no water, no beer. So, um, you know, y'all depend on utilities and we sure depend on y'all to give us some great beer. That's it. Uh, I know I went over a little bit, sorry about that, but um, hopefully most of y'all stayed with, with it here. And if you've got some questions, you can certainly route them to Ashley and, and Michael. And if you have any other questions and want to get in touch with uh, me directly or, or Mary Alice Corcoran with Adam, here's our contact information. Um, thank you. I, I don't know if we've got time for questions, Ashley, but um, I'm here if you need me to go through them now. Hey, Jim. Yeah, definitely. And, and first of all, thank you so much for the great presentation. Uh, your knowledge and expertise in this area comes across just perfectly clear. And I know our team took notes and I expect most of us attendants also took notes and got some great information from that again. So one of the questions that came through on mine is in regard to city inspections. Does ADEM oversee the frequency at which cities or utilities come around to uh, us local brewers and, and kind of check up on us? I know that they do come out, but is there a specific schedule that ADEM requires or, or does ADEM ever accompany cities whenever they come out and do inspections? Generally not, but it, that is the, it's a good question because it all boils down to if you're a significant industrial discharger, then ADEM will issue an SID, a state indirect discharge permit to your brewery. So that's the, essentially the brewery, uh, the city utility saying, hey, ADEM, protect us from industrial discharges. And that way, if you, if you hold an SID permit and you violate it, you would incur ADEM enforcement and you'll get inspected by ADEM. But if your brewery is regulated only locally through an ordinance, you will not have an ADEM inspection and you should be safe from that. Got you. Thank you so much for answering that one. And any other questions? We do have a few coming in as, uh, in the chat feature. What our team is going to do is compile those, Jim, and then we're going to send those out just to honor everybody's time today uh, to let everybody get on back to uh, brewing some great beer, which I know a few of us can't wait until five o'clock or the weekend <laughs> to get to sample in that. I wanted to thank Jim again and Mary Alice for being in attendance today, as well as everyone on the call today. Up on the screen now, you should have the contact information for Jim, as well as Michael Raspberry, who kicked us off this morning, and myself, I'm Ashley Chambers. I'm with Safe State as the Environmental Services Manager. And we are very excited to partner with all of you in regards to pollution prevention strategies you can implement there at your brewery or other industrial uh, areas as well. So please plan to join us tomorrow. If you didn't uh, get the invitation for tomorrow's uh, webinar, we will be discussing energy efficiency challenges at craft breweries and distilleries. And our speaker will be Dr. David McPhee. He's with the College of Engineering here on campus at the University of Alabama, as well as the Industrial Assessment Center. And we look forward to that. And again, we thank everybody so much for joining us today. We hope everyone learned a lot and has a great day. Thank you again, everyone.